an amazing start. Thank you guys. <laughs> um, next up, we have Russ Aguilar. I'm sorry, let me put the mic down because I don't want to cause too much feedback. Um, yes. Russ Aguilar is an environmental educator from Marin County, California. Um, he has worked with the national, as a national park educator across the country and is now the community programs manager for Literacy for Environmental Justice, where he directs a job development program and environmental education program, and he's going to explain all about it in a minute. So we'll for Russ. Woo, Russ! Hi, uh, thank you guys so much for being here. Uh, I really couldn't have asked for a better speaker to uh, go after, uh, so I want to just give another round of applause to you, and, you know, um, and I'll get to why the National Park Service has such a special place in my heart in a minute, but first I want to um, introduce uh, Literacy for Environmental Justice. So, Literacy for Environmental Justice is a um, nonprofit based in Southeast San Francisco. What I think really makes LEDGE stand out is that it is very grounded in the local community connecting with other organizations, with policymakers um, and planners in Southeast San Francisco in the Bayview Hunters Point area to determine what the needs are for the community. So whereas San Francisco is host to some of the most famous and renowned um, nonprofit, environmental nonprofits and some amazing national parks, I think that what we do better than any other organization is being really plugged into where we serve, whom we're serving. Um, so I'll just briefly read our, our mission statement. Literacy for environmental justice promotes ecological health, environmental stewardship, and community development in Southeast San Francisco by creating urban greening, eco-literacy, community stewardship, and workforce development opportunities that engage and support local residents in securing a healthier future. So, um, Southeast San Francisco is where a hugely disproportionate number of heavy industries and other pollutive, um, contaminative uh, activities have been done and are still occurring. And um, so that it was that, it was the community response to even further um, uh, the development of a, a fuel oil burning power plant that was planned in the 90s. The community responded to that, shut down that plant, installed underground, um, underground power to the city instead. And uh, our organization in 1998 was formed um, out of that movement with a focus on uh, connecting people to the land and educating people. So um, I would have to say, so the National Park Service has been a really important um, force in my development as an environmental educator. When I was just 18 years old, I got an opportunity to help run an urban outreach program that brought, um, that brought families who had never been camping and never visited any national parks in the cities of Seattle and Tacoma to Mount Rainier National Park. And I became an environment, I was an environmental educator through that program. I was hooked. Um, that was in 2010. I've been doing this kind of work ever since. And uh, it was right right around then when these conversations about connecting um, urban, urban families and even communities in rural areas that don't have access to, to parks um, to places like national parks. So I was I, that started off my, my career, and I got to this. I got to work in Alaska, uh, Columbia Gold, um, Yellowstone, on the Big Island of Hawaii, and um, on in the nation's capital. And um, I returned to the Bay Area, which is where I'm from, and uh, you know, with a, a lot of really great experiences in environmental ed. And something that that I really tried to consider is just what we were hearing about, how can we connect people with the parks in our backyards, in our immediate communities? How can those places be turned into places for empowerment, education, and um, literacy towards both social and environmental issues? And so, whereas Mount Rainier, if you ever get the chance to visit, please visit. Mount Rainier is always going to be two hours away from the major urban centers of uh, the Pacific Northwest. And the communities that, that I worked with in Mount Rainier, um, they, it, it, there are going to be significant barriers to getting to Mount Rainier. And so when I started at Literacy for Environmental Justice, I was just over the moon because we're located at, um, predominantly at Candlestick Point State Recreation Area, which is in the city of San Francisco. And at, I've been performing um, programs at that park and other parks in the city to try to build 
uh, just a, that sort of daily connection with nature that is so needed for people in any part of the country. Um, very lucky to be partnered with um, the State Park Service and San Francisco Rec and Parks in that work. So I'm not going to go into too much detail about the Eco Adventure Program, but one part of um, what Ledge does is connect kids from uh, kindergarten all the way up through college to uh, based like field trip based education, one or two days to visit a park that they might live only a mile from and give them a totally new perspective on it, on it and also give them the chance to get their hands dirty in, in um, working on the landscape, whether it's stewardship, um, you know, or even sometimes uh, helping educate others. So I want to talk about the uh, Eco Apprentice Program, which is a green workforce development program that Literacy for Environmental Justice has been running for some years. So we had a really successful summer with the Eco Apprentices. And um, I want, I'm going to go over the four components of that. So we was our, it was, um, we're trying to try to return to form since the pandemic diminished our capacity. And it was a 10 week program. Participants were paid $20 an hour for the 20 hours per week that they were, sometimes more when we had extra need. Um, we recruited from San Francisco, so um, everyone, all the participants are living in San, were living in San Francisco. Um, every participant except one was raised in, uh, in, San, in the San Francisco Bay Area. Um, and so here's a photo of the, uh, some of the Eco Apprentices and one of the interns working in the, um, working in the nursery. So getting, uh, getting intimately connected to native plants that are going to go out onto the landscape. So I just wanted to show you guys some of the photos that I got of our Eco Apprentices. Um, from the left, we did a little tree survey of the, uh, yard, of the community garden and candlestick. Um, uh, next over, uh, we see one of the interns and uh, V who are exploring invertebrates down by the Tidelands as a part of an educational program that we're performing. Um, uh, Leah and Rhea are uh, helping out with a nature walk in the next photo over. And um, Zoe right here is also participating in the tree survey. So, um, uh, Valerie and Vincent, they were recruited right from San Francisco State. So we have a great partnership with them. And they just finished their degrees in um, recreation in parks, um, which was really lucky for us because they were gone ho about the work that we were doing. Um, so these are transitional, transitional age uh, participants. Um, Zoe's just starting her, she just transferred to San Francisco State and she's told us that she wants to study rec and parks, um, recreation, parks, and tourism in that department. Um, and then we have uh, yeah, um, Leah and Rhea from uh, two small liberal arts colleges in Minnesota, which is great because I went to Carleton, which is a small liberal arts college in Minnesota as well. So, but also both from San Francisco. So, um, the area that we're working in, if you're not familiar with, uh, the Bayview Hunters Point, um, it's undergone many changes since it uh, since the colonial period. First, it was an Italian, uh, mostly Italian. Um, there was a Chinese shrimp fishing village in um, the Bayview Hunters Point, which was destroyed by the Department of Public Health. Um, and more recently, um, there's the predominant uh, issue facing environmental health in Bayview Hunters Point is the legacy of heavy industry. So in addition to there being power plant, there's a sewage treatment plant that treats 80% of the city's wastewater. Um, there's also, uh, um, uh, there, you, there was the largest shipyard in the in the entire west, the entire western United States. Actually, the entire, largest shipyard in Western North America was located at Hunters Point. It was the busiest shipyard for 50 years. Not only was it were they building um, building heavy navy vessels, repairing them, it was also the site of one of the navy's radiological labs. So there's a considerable amount of heavy metal pollution uh, that's still in the grounds there as well as radioactive uh, nucleotides that the community is grappling with. Um, the, because of the Great Migration, it is a historically black neighborhood. Um, the, most of the people working in the shipyard were African Americans during the periods of its operation. Since they were disenfranchised both politically and also by union membership with the closure of the shipyard, uh, they were, did not get access to a lot of the types of work that other union um, laid off union workers get, and uh, there's there's a there's still struggles with unemployment. Um, 
we focused on the um, on doing some environmental health monitoring. So we did. Uh, we partnered with the East Bay Academy for Young Scientists, which is an amazing program that's ran by Lawrence Livermore Labs and UC Berkeley, and they came to us with an awesome technical expertise. Um, we learned uh, GIS. Does anyone use GIS in their work? <coughs> yeah, that's a lot of people. So I felt that that was a really important thing to get our eco apprentices exposure to. So they had an introduction to uh, GIS software and also the tangible work of collecting soil samples, mapping soil samples, collecting air samples, doing some water testing all throughout Southeast San Francisco. Um, by working with eBay's, we had access to an extremely high-tech and high-resolution uh, elemental contamination monitoring um, device where we scanned our soil samples to create the map that I'm about to show you. Um, so there's, um, it's a little bit hard to see, so, but these, these colored dots that you're looking at are, uh, they represent levels of lead. Uh, lead is a legacy from, uh, it's a contaminant not only from uh, heavy metals uh, in, I mean, from the shipyard, but also from paint, from light industry, from residential redevelopment, and in, we compared Noe Valley, which is a uh, more upper middle class neighborhood to Bayview Hunters Point, we found high levels of um, lead contamination in both sites. So this is a preliminary study. We're going to continue with um, more uh, eco apprentices in the future to create a uh, stronger map with uh, more samples. They learned about uh, volunteer coordination, so we hosted about 200 volunteers over the summer. They um, learned tool, uh, how to use tools on the landscape and help train uh, community members and other um, volunteer groups. So here we are. Uh, mulching a site that's going to be reopened as a campsite at Candlestick Point. Um, we partnered with the Candlestick uh, Point State Recreation Area's uh, summer camp to provide a kayaking experience and also to do nature hikes. So they, after taking some classes with me about best practices on doing nature hikes and environmental education, they got to perform their own, uh, their own outdoor education programs by the end of the summer. And they helped me perform eco-adventure day programs throughout the summer as well. So. Um, we learned about interpretation, uh, which is you know giving educational, informational, and inspirational tours to the general public, and they performed a tour of our community garden. Um, in addition to that, with the Urban Greening team, um, they removed hundreds of pounds of invasive uh, plants from the landscape in San Francisco and planted hundreds of native native plants in their um, in their work with the Urban Greening team. Um, learned uh, about the best practices of environmental restoration and um, the restoration cycle, everything from collecting seeds to propagating plants as little ones and getting them ready to be planted out into the landscape. So I've already talked a little bit about the, um, the analysis, the environmental health analysis that we've done, but here we are collecting a soil sample from the uh, from Gilman Playground. And one thing that I'm happy to report, whereas um, in residential areas in Southeast San Francisco, lead is a major issue. In areas that have been remediated by the city, where the soil has been replaced, we found really clean samples. So I guess it's just, just to goes to show that remediating soil um, in residential areas, especially with a, an agency like the city itself that is invested in the community health, can be an effective measure. But looking in unusual places, uh, like we did, um, like right on the bay shore, you might find unusual things. Like we found a lot of lead uh, flowing right into the bay, right where people play. So um, I touched base with our eco apprentices since the summer, and I'm really encouraged to see that um, um, most of them are pursuing work, pursuing careers in conservation. So uh, Vincent is a um, intern in another um, stewardship program in San Francisco. Um, Valerie is looking for work in um, parks and recreation in San Francisco as well. Uh, Ray is on the pre-med track at um, St. Uh, Olaf College, where she says that she wants to study environmental health and, and look to how um, heavy and light industry are impacting people's lives in the day to day. Um, Leah is studying indigenous conservation practices, so she's on her, she's going to be traveling uh, to uh, Latin America this year um, to see about uh, different ways to manage the landscape. And Zoe has uh, decided that she's going to study recreation, parks, and tourism. 
So this is the first um, first eCode uh, apprentice program that I've had the privilege to direct with Ledge. Um, the, our goals for future iterations are doubling the size of our program to 12 participants. And whereas the group that we had, we had a um, it was fairly representative of San Francisco as a whole, but we could have done a much better job finding uh, participants that were representative specifically of the Bayview Hunters Point um, area. So that's something that I'm working on right now because in just a month, uh, just a few months, we're going to be recruiting uh, eco apprentices. We're going to have a longer program and grow on a lot of the, the things that we did together. We um, built 14, we helped build 14 garden boxes in the community garden. Um, we did outreach at the California County of Sciences. We went fishing and we helped out with the summer camp and um, studied invertebrates and other wildlife at uh, Candlestick Point. So we're going to learn uh, learn from those experiences to create uh, even better ones for future participants. So thank you very much. They were really important mentors for the Eco Apprentices. So. Thank you, Green and Team and Russ. Uh, I think we have room for two or three questions. Yes. So obviously, your apprentices were super motivated when they finished the program, and they have all these hopes for their future. What kept them happy? What kept them? Involved throughout the program, what, what do you think were the, the biggest factors? Um, let's see. I, I really think that uh, one thing that Ledge does a really good job of is hiring and, and keeping people who are really passionate about the work that they do. So the Urban Greening team, all they, I shared my story about um, working around the country in conservation. The Urban Greening team did the same. Um, we had a career panel uh, that was in the first third of the program where they got to interview and hear from conservation professionals all throughout, uh, all throughout San Francisco. We had professional development days where we uh, gave, gave practical considerations as well as uh, an overview of conservation to show that it really is possible. And I really think that um, having tangible uh, tangible work like that map that I showed you like this is that I just sent that data to the city of San Francisco's uh, building and um, building inspection department because we found specific buildings that are flaking off lead next to schools next to a daycare and that um, they gave a presentation at the um, environmental justice task force so having those empowering opportunities and also being able to put plants in the grounds and in places that they may have been visiting since they were kids knowing that they made an impact in that way. I think, I mean, we had very, um, you know, people showed up pretty much every day. It was also paid. They made $20 an hour. That's really important. There is a lot of competition, especially among, uh, these, are, these are some really talented uh, young people um, in some of, the best, some of the best undergraduate programs. And there's competition for those roles. And I was really glad that they were we're spending our time with us rather than like an internship at Autodesk or Intel or something like that. Because those were the opportunities that they could have chosen. Um, I hope that answers your question. Absolutely, thanks. Awesome. Uh, I think we might have two more questions available. Anyone else? Yes. As a nonprofit, how do you get funding? Oh, I forgot to get to that slide, but um, <laughs> <laughs> thank you. Um, so it's a one really, we've been hearing a lot in the national news media about like the Green New Deal and the promise of a green job for everyone. That hasn't gone through, but local groups and cities and states have taken up that standard, meaning that as every year goes by, they understand the importance of having green jobs for young people and people of all ages. And they, uh, conservation cores are growing and also grant funding opportunities from the state, like we have a state fund that helped us with fund this program. And uh, community foundations and, not, and private foundations are also helping lead this chart. So in the absence of federal legislation, local organizations and state organizations and city, uh, city funders um, like the SF Department of the Environment, they are helping fill, fill that gap by funding programs like this. We're partnering with um, a pre-apprenticeship program so that I'll be trained to train people, to train our eco-apprentices so that they can go into U.S. Department of Labor uh, certified apprenticeship programs, which are very, very well paid um, for uh, blue collar, well, conservation work and also blue collar jobs. Um, yeah. And that concludes our 
time for questions. Uh, but thank you again, Russ. I appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you.